Good morning, everyone. Um, hopefully, the people will be joining us. Sorry for the slight delay. We've got a couple of technical issues this end, um, um, but we will be starting in a second. Thank you for your um, patience to all of the people who have, have joined us. Good morning. Um, I'm just going to um, make sure that everyone has joined. As there are a few more attendees joining us, so good morning, welcome. Sorry for the delay. Um, just bear with me one second. Sorry, I've um, just get my screens right. Let's move everything onto a different screen. <laughs> so, good morning, everyone. And welcome to our Muscle Matters seminar on uh, Myasthenia Gravis. Um, we're focusing on adults with Myasthenia Gravis this morning. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsors for today, which are PTC Therapeutics and Alexion Pharmaceuticals. We've got a great agenda and a real fantastic array of speakers with us um, today. And we're going to begin with a focus on research and clinical trials. And then we'll move on to discuss living with Myasthenia Gravis where we'll focus on answering questions that you can send to us today and, and questions that we've had in advance. To submit questions today, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen on the Zoom functionality, you should have a Q&A function. Um, please type your question or comment in and we'll try and feed those into the discussion. Um, you won't be able to ask questions um, out loud, but we will feed them through um, through the, the channel, through the, the chat. Um, and any questions that we don't manage to cover today, or if we don't even fact know the answers to them, we will seek to answer those through our website in the coming days. Just to note to, before we begin that our helpline is available to anyone affected by muscle wasting conditions. And please do contact us if you have any questions or are in need of support. We can help you with information and can either support you di directly or point you to others who can give you support. The number and email address should be on your screen now. Our telephone number is 0800 652 6352 or email us at info at dystrophyuk.org. And just as a final reminder, we'll be recording this session and it will be made available in the next few days through our website and our YouTube channel. So without further ado, let's um, get to the um, meet of our session today. First of all, um, I'd like to introduce you to some, some people for our research session. Um, first of all, uh, Professor Maria Isabel Leiter, who is um, Associate Professor and Consultant Neurologist with clinical and laboratory experience in the field of autoimmune neurology at the University of Oxford and Oxford University Hospitals. Her interests include my, autoimmune myasthenic disorders, particularly myasthenia gravis associated with acetylcholine receptors or musk antibodies and Lambert-Eaton myasthenia syndrome. She's interested in how these conditions develop over time, how we can predict how they might develop in response to treatment, and ultimately her work aimed to improve therapies and outcomes for patients with autoimmune neurological diseases. Alongside her research, Professor Leiter is involved in teaching of undergraduates, supervising masters and doctoral students, as well as providing clinical training in autoimmune neurology to UK and overseas um, researchers and clinicians. We're also going to hear from Dr. Uh, Chana Humaduma, who is consultant neurologist with specialist interest in, neuromus in neuromuscular disorders at Sheffield T Teaching Hospitals Foundation Trust and an honorary senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield. He has a specialist interest in a broad spectrum of neuromuscular disorders, such as muscular dystrophies, and of course, myasthenia gravis. He's co-chair of the Yorkshire and Humber Neuromuscular Network and leads several clinical trials in, in several neuromuscular disorders, including Duchenne muscular dystrophy, myasthenia gravis, and hereditary spastic paraparesis at Sheffield Teaching Hospitals Foundation Trust. And finally, in this session, we'll be, I'm delighted that we're being joined by Charlotte Campbell, Charlotte is the Research and Partners Officer at MyAware, which is the UK charity living for those living with myasthenia. Her role in, involves overseeing the medical research funded by the charity and supporting the continuous milestones in, their, in everyone's understanding of the condition. She also engages in numerous, um, with numerous external stakeholders on behalf of the charity, 
and Charlotte lives in Scotland, has a degree in molecular genetics. So thank you. Um, I am going to um, hand over, I think, to Chana so that I can make sure I've got it, um, Maria's talks um, up on my screen ready to go. Chana, are you OK to, to, to go first? Are you all set? Yes, um, I'm all set. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Or does Marvelous. It... Uh, I think Professor Leite's talk complements my talk because uh, Professor Leite is going to talk about the basic science and, and the understanding of myasthenia. And then I'm going to build on that to talk about the clinical trials. Uh, okay, so well, I would prefer I... if Professor Leite could go first. Okay, perfect. Give me, oh, I'm now lost. Zoom. Are you all still there? <laughs> that was scary. The screen just went blank. Okay, here we go. I'm going to try and share it then. Does that? Yeah, that's that... good, Kate. Brilliant. So, Maria Isabel, you're going to have to channel yeah. your inner Chris Whitty and tell me next slide, please. Any every time you need me to no move problem. things on. It's old fashioned, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really delighted to be here today. It's the first time I I speak. Uh, in in such um, a, to such a platform in the in the UK, um, although I have been collaborating for a while. So we will speak about myasthenia gravis, and we felt that the first thing is to understand what it is. All the patients understand well their symptoms, they understand their condition, the treatments, etc. But if we go to the basics where things happen in their muscles or neuromuscular junction, let's say, it's easier than to understand symptoms and understand the treatments and more so now understand the new treatments that are arriving and that it's a very exciting time for myasthenia community and the doctors because we have been treating patients with the same treatments for many decades. So we aim to understand the monopathogenic mechanisms of disease to next, you can go ahead and to best treat the patients. That's always the, the aim. And here it is, you know already why I am. You can go to the next one where I have my disclosures. And you, if you click again, you'll see, so it's part of so the logos where, so we are a European reference network center, is the Oxford Myasthenia Center. Uh, I'm, part of the University NHS and Neuroscience Department and have um, a role in the MyAware and also I have grants from MyAware in addition to the university and other sources. Thank you. Next one, please. At the glance, I will say we are going through the immunopathogenic mechanisms. This means because you know that the myasthenia is an autoimmune condition, it's the immune system that is affected. So, and the pathogenic means cause disease. So it's basically going to the mechanism, what causes the myasthenia gravis. And we'll speak about that according to the two main antibody uh, disease, antibody mediated diseases or subgroups according to their antibody against one of the receptors that is called acetylcholine receptor or muscle specific kinase that is the other uh, receptor. And both are in the neuromuscular junction, which I'll show you in a moment. Majority of people have ACH antibodies, not masks. So you probably in a group of patients that are attending today or members of the UK, uh, if you are a patient, you are more likely to have ACH antibodies than mask antibodies, but I'll say about both. 
So we'll speak about what are the key organs or molecules or proteins in your body or cells that are relevant to not only understand the condition, but to understand the standard current treatments for myasthenia. And the next is to think about the key molecules that are relevant to targets for immunotherapies used in recent on, and ongoing phase three clinical trials for myasthenia. So going even back to even more basic, where does the movement comes from? How does it happen? How does movement happen? So it's not only based on the muscle or neuromuscular junction or the nerves. It includes central nerve system and peripheral nerve system. I can't show the um, uh, pointer, but the, I think it's clear there. You'll see on the left top, um, on my left at least, top, the brain. And that pink area is the motor cortex. Motor means produce movement. And that when you, we think the cortex is more volunteer. So if we want to move a limb, we do that voluntarily. We sometimes also move automatically without even thinking or reaction to being burnt or, or pain or so. So from there, there, there is a, um, a column of axons that come down from the brain, cross the brain stem, and cross to the other side, from the left to the right, or the other way around, doesn't matter, and come to the, the spinal cord. And from there, from the anterior horns, comes along the nerve roots, nerves, and that impulse, the nerve, with the electric impulse, comes to to the muscle by a, a nerve terminal. And that is where the nerve meets the muscle. And that's where the myasthenia or the problem related to myasthenia is. So if we go to the next one, now that part in more detail, you see still the spinal cord, you see the nerves coming from the spinal cord, then they, they start Branch, having different branches, and they go to the muscle fibers. Instead of seeing a full muscle, muscle is full of small fibers. And the nerves go to the nerves, the end of the nerves go to, to join the muscle in a certain structure organized that is called the neuromuscular junction is where the nerve meets the muscle and sends a signal that becomes a neurochemical signal to the muscle and makes the muscle contract. So if we now go to the next one. So if this is the normal neuromuscular junction, so see on the top in yellow, the end uh, or the terminal of the nerve, where there's some vesicles with red dots that are called, the red dots contain acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is produced in the nerve and then drops in this interval between the nerve and the muscle in the neuromuscular junction. So the problem in myasthenia is on the lower part, that is the postsynaptic. So a synapse is where one nerve meets the other or nerve meets the muscle. So where there is a link between two structures is a synapse. So the top, that is the nerve, is a presynaptic part. The muscle part has a postsynaptic, and that's where the key molecules relevant in myasthenia are. That is, they are in blue, the receptors that are more commonly affected, the ACHR. 
Then you have a structure with the four uh, like uh, steps there. That is in the middle, there are two musk equal, equal. So two like sticks there. And then beside them, another two that are very close together that are called LRP4. Don't worry about thinking about all these names. So if we go back to the ACHR, you see the blues or blue green that color. In the middle, you see them, three of them all clustered and on the sides, they are detisolated. So for the neuromuscular junction to function very well, they need to be clusters. And it contracts muscle much better if they are clustered. So what happens is when the acetylcholine comes from the end of the terminal of the nerve in terminal, and binds to the acetylcholine receptor that accepts them. The receptors open inside a channel that they have there. You see there a channel, and that is, that is called a, a sodium channel, and that makes the the contraction of the muscle. So if you see point one on the left, it says. Um, releasing of ACH to its receptor. Then point two, that is the opening of the ACHRs, either where they are isolated or as clusters. And then the muscle gets that, um, that signal and contracts as a result and contracts means, uh, means strength and movement. That's how it works. This is the normal. For the mask, what does it do? What does mask do there? So you see also some blue or, or so green dots that are called agreen, also come from the nerve. And the agreen binds to LRP4. That then talks to the mask. And what they do, they internally, inside of the, the muscle cell, activate a system that goes to cluster the ACHRs. So if the ACHRs are relaxed and all beside one the other, but not very together, mask, after being activated by LRP4, activated by agrin, makes them clustered all together. And that way, the muscle contracts much better and effectively. So we have two main key molecules, two main key um, receptors there or so. So you have agrin, you have asticlin, you have asticlin receptor, mask, that is a receptor as well, as you want, and LRP4. And ideally, all of these work together nicely. There is now one small thing there on the right that is brownish or so. That is an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. That is used to recycle the acetylcholine. So acetylcholine comes from the nerve, is released, binds to the acetylcholine receptor, but doesn't go down the, 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 the muscle, remains there on top, and then is um, divided, is not say degraded, but is recycled again. And then that, those two bits go back to the nerve and form again more acetylcholine. Okay, so the acetylcholine is degraded by acetylcholine esterase. So if you imagine if for the muscle to contract more and more effectively and constantly in repetitive nerves, you need repetitive movements, you need all this working well, but certainly the more acetylcholine you have there, a normal level, let's say not too extra also, if you have more than what myasthenia patients have, you can have 
a better function of the, the neuromuscular junction. And to increase that, we can't take tablets of acetylcholine. What we do is to reduce the degradation of the acetylcholine is raised by taking, for example, pyridostigmine or mestina. And by doing that, this, this enzyme doesn't work so much and keeps the acetylcholine there instead of being degraded so quickly. Here we are. Now, can we go to the next slide, please? So we know that this disease is, and is autoimmune. And so patients will have autoantibodies that affect the postsynaptic membrane of neuromuscular junction that I have just shown you. And there are two main disease subgroups. They have the acetylcholine receptor antibody disease, the, what, the patients who have antibodies that bind to the acetylcholine receptor and so will do cause disease. They are not going to function so well as I show with you. They will see how it works. They are a certain subtype. We have many different subtypes of antibodies. They are what we call IG1 or IG3, and they activate a certain molecule in our body that leads to damage. For example, if we are in, have an infection with a bug, our body protects us by producing antibodies and increasing the complement activation. So everything goes and attacks the bug, kills the bug. That is normal. What is not good is when the same system is, is abnormal and starts activating complement, producing antibodies that damage part of our body or part of our organs or, or whatever, in this case, the neuromuscular junction. Then you wonder where these antibodies come from. They are produced by cells. We'll see in a moment. This subtype of disease with ACH antibodies in a great proportion of patients will have a problem in their thymus thymus, the gland behind your chest bone. And either thymus is enlarged or has a tumor. Somehow the thymus seem to have a, pr a problem there that leads or facilitates or triggers they, this form of condition, not to the musk one. And in particular, this group of patients have also other autoimmune conditions. Many patients will know that I have also thyroid disease, have pernicious anemia, they may have lupus, they may have other conditions, vitiligo, and if not them, sometimes it's their family members that have other autoimmune diseases. So it means that it's not probably enough to have um, abnormality in thymus or this antibody. What is behind that is probably some predisposition that could be genetic, could be other type. So several factors together. It's not genetic, but can be uh, triggered by different uh, factors. Then we have the other subtype of disease that is associated with muscle-specific kinase antibodies, that antibodies to, that bind to the other receptor that is those two sticks that you have just seen that are next to LRP4. These antibodies have a different marker. They are IG4 or IG2. And this means they don't activate complement. They have to work by themselves. They have no help of complement. This is really interesting because while in the group above, you have complement activation, you damage the neuromuscular junction. Here, what it does is dysfunction neuromuscular junction, doesn't destroy, doesn't damage physically to have it burnt out. What it does is not allowing the ACH antibodies to keep clustered and they are dispersed. If they are dispersed, the muscle doesn't contract so well as if it was normal. So these are the two types of conditions based on what antibodies they have. They may have 
similar symptoms. They may be treated initially with same treatments, but there is something different in their immune system that pre precipitates the production of one antibody the other, and they do different things in the same location, basically, but via different mechanisms. You kindly move. So on the left is exactly the same slide I have just shown. And on the right is the one with ACHR antibodies. So if you see again, the nerve terminal is the same. The receptors there are the same. So what we have now, see on the left, you see something saying anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies, and they will target the acetylcholine receptor in the neuromuscular junction. So by binding there, they target that receptor and they can cause disease via three different uh, mechanisms. And the complement activation is really the most relevant, not only because damage more, but also because it's the most frequent one, is that one. Perfect. So when they bind, they either bind and block the acetylcholine of binding, the one on the left, or they bind to two receptors and make them go into the, the, the muscle and they'll internalize and they become inactive, or they stay there on top, they bring complement, the complement is activated, and the complement has a cascade that ends in a in like a, a channel that makes a hole in the cell that is affected in this case in the muscle. So over time, if this complement activation remains there, then eventually the postsynaptic membrane that looks almost at this moment, nice, folded, etc., will eventually have that inflammation persisting and eventually the receptors start going away and the neuromuscular junction becomes flat, floppy, and the muscle cannot uh, contract much. And one of symptoms patients notice is that they don't have more fluctuations of their disease. They take pyridostigmine or mastinol, doesn't have any effect. They may take more steroids or not. So we fear that when that time comes, that is, after a long time on this, on or having these pathogenic mechanisms or pathogenic antibodies causing damage, if we don't stop this early on, the neuromuscular junction will be affected irreversibly. In the first time, first years or so, we may be able to revert that. When the patient has no more fluctuation and has persistent weakness or muscle atrophy, is done. So next slide, please. And what happens with the mask antibodies? Now it seems that we haven't moved slide, but we have. So see now on the right is again there. Now they are, they look the same as other antibodies. The antibodies usually are, we illustrate them as a big Y, something similar. They are in this case, mask antibodies. And you know they will not need complement to attack the neuromuscular junction. They do differently. So they bind to mask. The agrin that comes to LRP4, great. But then when agrin wants to bind and talk to mask, it's not effective because the antibodies are, are alt altering and, and are um, dysfunctioning the mask LRP4 link. And so what happens is that what hap should happen, like having, um, creating clusters, it doesn't do. So here, I probably, well, I do, oh, uh, yeah, okay. Let me just see that. Uh, point one, sorry that I couldn't see very well now. Uh, blocking the LRP4 is fine. Here is blocking, yes, mask. This is another way of doing is 
keeping the the molecules alone and they can talk to the to the uh, the LRP4 and they then do not lead to cluster the ACHRs in red. I do apologize. This arrow in red should have a cross to show that eventually they don't allow the clustering of the ACHRs, or if they are clustered, they will not persist clustered and they disperse. That's what the ACHR antibodies will do. Next one, please. So, and particularly in ACHR antibody disease, the postsynaptic membrane gets damaged. So you see on the left is a very old illustration, but it's very, very good. You see the neuron flow junction on the left. The postsynaptic membrane is nicely folded. So you have a huge um, surface of the, AC, of the neuron flow junction. After that, with long time, if you have damage of that on the right, you will see that the folders are much uh, less, they are more superficial, and you end up having a very flat neuromuscular junction or postsynaptic membrane and not functioning. So the first goal of our treatment in myasthenia is to preserve and protect the neuromuscular junction, particularly the postsynaptic membrane. Whatever we do, to reduce the antibodies, to reduce inflammation, to reduce the complement activation, whatever it is, is to protect the neuromuscular junction. So now we know that we have, and we know already all, we have antibodies. And I put there, all of us have antibodies in our body. All of us can have autoantibodies in a very low level, a variety of autoantibodies, but they don't cause disease. Now, certain people have a predisposition to have the, potentially the same antibodies and then have a proper condition, autoimmune. That's what is caused, caused by autoantibodies. And they can be AC shadow or musk. Now you wonder, where do they come from? Are they, they are produced by immune cells. And then we may need to go backwards. Okay. So antibody producing cells are in our immune system and they are either in the bone marrow, others are in the blood circulation, others are in lymph nodes, others are in certain organs. They are everywhere and they can increase if we have an infection. They can increase in number if we have an autoimmune condition. They can reduce if we take immunosuppression or if that certain of them are reduced, a certain number of them, if we receive rituximab or other treatments. So here, just to give you an idea, the lineage of B cells, B cells lead to cells that produce antibodies. And you see the very early on, babies, baby B cells, let's say, are in the bone marrow where they are born. They are called stem cells, then they are called pro-B cells, pre-B cells. They are going to get mature, but they go through the immature stage, then naive B cell, and when they meet uh, 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 an antigen that is the one that is going to then is like, in this case, the ACHR, or they meet the mask, or meet some proteins that are similar, or when they meet some other uh, molecules for other autoimmune disease, they become activated. And then they are activated, they start producing antibodies against that particular antigen, that particular protein. They grow even further, they produce more and more, they become plasma blasts and then plasma cells. And these plasma cells go back to the bone marrow and stay there. And their job, they live for very long, is producing antibodies. So you can imagine in a chronic illness, even if you get rid of some of the cells that are producing antibodies here in the periphery, in the blood, 
like when we give rituximab, for example, for patients on um, that kills the B cells, we may not get rid of all the antibodies quickly because we still have the old cells, well-known plasma cells that are very, very professional producing antibodies. So needs time for those cells to die and the new ones do not produce the antibodies. So in, on the bottom you see there is CD19 expression and CD20 expression. That means they have on their surface something that is called CD20, others is CD19, is a surface marker. And that shows that cells that express CD20 are the ones killed by rituximab. The ones that are express CD19 can be killed by a new drug that is still in trial that is anti-CD19. And as you can see here, from what we are understanding, probably an anti-CD19 killing CD19 cells may be more effective rather than CD20 in certain patients. May Isabel, leave them more sorry to Marie, it's Isabel, sorry to interrupt you. I was just wait, I'm just mindful of time. Um, is yeah. it possible we could, because we've got um, China to speak to um, now and we've, we've also got time for discussion. Can we, yeah. can we move a little faster, do you think? Sorry to interrupt. This yeah. is really, really interesting, very important, but um, yeah. I'm just mindful yeah, of the absolutely. time. This is much simpler now. Yeah, you can go ahead now. So Thank the you. goal too is to reduce the antibody production, antibodies in circulation and their pathogenic effects. So we need to reduce the antibodies. There are many ways of reducing. How and why does the immune system produce the antibodies? In myasthenia, we know thymus is very, very relevant. And you can show that a couple of pictures. So you have thymus in your chest, behind the chest bone. And in myasthenia with ACH antibodies, you have either a normal thymus, if you are older, or a thymus that is enlarged, or thymus with a thymoma. And you can go ahead. Now I show it here, here some slides where it just show you that on the left, you see a normal control thymus. On the right, the end, a mask patient thymus that in the old days would be removed. Now it's not. Only the middle ones are uh, uh, thymectomized or are removed because they are enlarged and they produce antibodies. Right. Why they produce antibodies? Because in the thymus, there are some structures called myoid cells that express the ACHR subunits. And so that's why in mask in the ACH antibody disease, the thymus gets activated and starts producing antibodies because it has there these odd cells that are look they look like muscle cells. The goal three is therefore reduce or stop the trigger to antibodies to the ACHR in myasthenia, and therefore stop the autoimmunization process and perpetuation of the autoimmune attack. This is the goal for the SHR because it's, it's part of the, the thymus. In the mask, we should have a, the same goal. But we don't have a place we can, where we can identify where the disease started. What was the trigger? We don't know. It's something we need to learn. That is my part. That. Thank you so much, thank Maria, you. Isabel. That was, that was really sorry um, that... thorough. Thank you. Um, Chana, here's hoping you've got um, battery left. <laughs> uh, you... Yes, I think I could I could manage. Uh, uh, I might take about 10, 12 minutes max. Um, let me see whether I can share it. I have already emailed the slides as well. Uh, but, 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 there you go. Share. Can you see my slides? Perfect. Yes, thank you. Oops. Just there we go. Perfect. So let me minimize. 
Well, uh, thank you very much, um, everyone, for um, uh, particularly MD UK for inviting me to your Muscles Matter uh, session. And, uh, um, and, and uh, this is a very important time to give time for myasthenia gravis. And I'm very grateful uh, for having uh, organized this. And I apologize that I'm stuck at an airport. And uh, 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 please pardon me for if there's any background noise. So as uh, Kate said, uh, I work in Sheffield. I'm a neuromuscular neurologist and I look after a, a spectrum of neuromuscular disorder patients. Um, right, how do I advance cell? Okay, and these are my disclosures. Uh, and um, I would like to talk to you about um, uh, drug development um, when it comes to clinical trials. So my topic today is to talk about uh, the emerging clinical trials and new drugs in myasthenia gravis. You, you heard uh, a, a excellent uh, uh, um, a summary and an explanation of the underlying pathology uh, behind the uh, myasthenia gravis, which is a neuromuscular disease. But when it comes to uh, looking at drugs to manage the condition, um, these drugs don't come about uh, straight away. There is a long process of identifying the targets where the drugs going to work and what are these drugs going to look like and are they safe um, uh, all this has to be first looked into and to do that there are initially uh, 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 um, studies undertaken in cellular models and then these uh, drugs are then taken on to uh, animal models like the mouse or the zebrafish to see whether these drugs are effective and, and they are safe once that uh, um, that process is complete and we are confident that these drugs are going to help the human disease, then the drugs will be used in a phase one clinical trial. Now, phase one means we are using healthy human volunteers and is a small number of people. They use uh, the drugs in these people to see whether the, how the drug behaves in the human body, and then also to see whether there are any major safety concerns. And if successful, then the drug moves on to the phase two clinical trial. Now, here is where, the, uh, where we recruit patients who are affected by the disease and um, again, a small proportion of patients are, are used um, for, for these trials to mainly uh, to assess the safety. And there are also secondary outcomes to see whether there is any efficacy. Um, and and uh, they also look at how the drug behaves within the human uh, body. And then uh, if there are, uh, uh, if the safety is confirmed, then the drug moves on to the phase three, which is a larger, uh, a larger group of uh, patients where they are randomized into two groups to, to receive the drug and then uh, another group to receive uh, uh, the DAD as it were. And um, these, are, these are classically called a double blind placebo control drug trials. If it is a drug or if it is a device, then it is a device study. And when this uh, study is complete and if, it, if safety and efficacy is confirmed, then the sponsors or the pharma company or the researchers will take this drug to the regulatory bodies to get it approved for regular clinical use. And, and sometimes the, the, uh, the, the regulators will review the uh, data and say, well, it is not uh, safe enough or efficacy is not good enough. We need to monitor it further. And it might move to a phase four study or what we call uh, a post-marketing surveillance where we need to get uh, get a bit more understanding of how the drug uh, is utilized, what dose to use, and what patients, etc., which is called a phase four or the post-marketing surveillance. Now, with that in mind, um, I would like to show you a, a, a diagram of what a randomized placebo control study will look like because you will hear about these uh, words uh, throughout in the next uh, few years because there is a huge number of drug trials coming through for myasthenia gravis. So uh, on, on the left-hand side of the diagram here, you can see a, a, a large a group of uh, patients with, a, for example, myasthenia. And these patients, for uh, to undergo a clinical trial, they have to meet some inclusion criteria and they should not meet the exclusion criteria. So if they meet all the criteria, then they get automatically randomized to, to receive the drug or to the placebo. Um, now, why is it double blind? Double blind means the patient nor the clinician who's assessing the patient to see whether this is, uh, it is causing any harm or benefit will not know um, who receives the drug and who receives the placebo. So there'll be a, 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 a defined period of where this randomization continues. And then after that, everyone who wants to go on to the open label gets the drug um, um, for a period of, period of time. And there'll be outcome measures to see uh, 
um, whether this drug is effective uh, and safe. Um, this diagram is to show you that uh, before 2004, 2005 time, there weren't many clinical trials. These, these dots that you see are cl different clinical trials in myasthenia gravis. And uh, by about 2018, there was a relative increase in the number of clinical trials in myasthenia gravis. Now, to our excitement and uh, um, by 2021, there is a significant explosion of number of clinical trials, number of different compounds looked at um, in clinical trials to see whether we can use them to modify um, one uh, or more goals that Isabel outlined earlier. So, um, we know that myasthenia gravis, gravis means it, it used to be very grave consequences, as grave as people used to die from it. But with the advent of improved patient care and uh, introduction of ventilation, antibiotics, steroids, this mortality or the death related to myasthenia has significantly come down. However, we all know that there is a significant amount of morbidity or disease burden that still exists and, and, uh, and, and plagues our patients. And you are familiar with this neuromuscular junction, which is where the problem happens when you're trying to tackle a, 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 a problem. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, uh, when you're trying to tra tackle a, a problem, um, we need to know who your enemy is and where they are hiding and how to target them. And Isabel nicely outlined where the targets are, the thymus, the B cells, the complement, um, and, and these antibodies are our targets. Um, so, um, we know that uh, there are uh, treatments currently, pyridostigmine uh, or mestinone to help uh, improve the symptoms and people undergo thymectomy or steroids. They have azathioprine to reduce the immune uh, um, uh, reaction, uh, but th they, these are not enough uh, to help our patients. So these are, this is called unmet needs. We know that we, we have treatments, but this is not good enough to help our patients. But we know that one third of our myasthenic patients have a significant resistance to uh, immunosuppressive therapy. And although steroids is effective, we know that steroids are associated with significant side effects and they're unacceptable. And immunosuppressive therapy is are there, but they are, uh, they are either ineffective or they take a long time to take effect. Um, one might say there is plasma exchange or IVIG, but these are cumbersome or difficult to find uh, and, and um, are, are not uh, quite fit for purpose on a very long-term basis. So therefore, people have started rethinking where we can target uh, uh, new therapies. So two areas that I'm going to talk to you today is the complement that uh, we, uh, uh, we, we uh, gathered a bit more knowledge now that uh, acetylcholine receptors recruit this normal uh, part of the immune system called the complement. But what happens in myasthenia gravis is that it destroys your neuromuscular junction. So can we inhibit the complement to some extent to help our myasthenic patients? We know that acetylcholine receptor antibodies are, are one of the main culprits, but can we get rid of it? And can we use a new method called the FCRN receptor inhibition? So these are the two areas that I'm going to talk to you about because there are a number of drugs drug trials coming up in these areas. I'm not going to talk to you today about how you modify the B cell function because there is another group of drugs currently being studied in that area. In the interest of the time, I'm going to talk to you about the complement. Now, we did hear about the complement from a, a previous talk. And complement is a, a naturally occurring system, as we heard, to uh, attack the bugs or uh, abnormal uh, pathogens. Now, complement is like a, a domino system. There are multiple little elements called C1 to C9. One triggers the other. And what you can see here is that the terminal complement, C5, when it is activated, it recruits C6, C7, C8, C9. And what it does is that it creates a drill or, or what we call a membrane attack complex. Uh, and this drills holes in your cells. Now, these cells could be the bacteria or it could be a neuromuscular junction. And then what you can see here is that water molecules seeping in these through holes or the good nutrients come out of these cells and then the cells die. And um, so how can we target the complement? There are three drugs. We are targeting the C5 component because this is the end of the complement. So that the, the, the beginning components are still active. They can help our immune system. But the C, when you block C5, um, then we hope that that might help myasthenia gravis. Now, there are three main drugs, echilizumab, revoluzumab, or zulucaplin. So these have been trialed in what we call the double-blind placebo control uh, randomized clinical trials. and 
and they have all shown to be effective. Now, they, they studied acetylcholine receptor antibody positive myasthenia gravis patients. The eculizumab has been used as intravenous infusions every two weeks. Ravilizumab is given IV every eight weeks, while the zilucoplan is given under the skin on a daily basis, like a small injection. Now, I would like to uh, pay attention a little bit onto the echilizumab because this is uh, this trial, the REGAIN trial, is an interesting trial that they use people who were resistant to other immunosuppressive therapies. So their trial is a little bit special. In that special trial design, there was a problem that uh, unfortunately the primary outcome, which is the main outcome, was not met very just by a small margin. However, the secondary outcomes were all met and as the result of that, FDA in the US, which is a regulatory body, um, has given approval for use of eculizumab in seropositive uh, myasthenia gravis, the ACHR positive myasthenia gravis. Now, Revolizumab and Zilucoplan have met all their primary, that's the main and the other outcome measures, and Revolizumab has also received the uh, approval from the USA. Uh, FDA. And Zilucoplan, I, I believe, is undergoing this uh, process. So, I would like to show this diagram from the Zilukaban trial. So what you can see in the blue line here are the patients uh, uh, who received Zilukaban and gray line is those, are those who received the placebo. Now you could see that uh, the, the benefit as measured by the MGADL, that's myasthenia gravis activities of daily living, uh, a patient reported outcome um, measure, and they felt that their myasthenia related symptoms significantly improved even as early as first week of treatment. And this improvement, and you can see that, is maintained through uh, to the end of the trendomized period, which is a 12 week. But also the other thing that I want to show you here is that there is also an improvement in the placebo treated arm. Now, this is precisely why we have this very uh, um, uh, well-designed randomized placebo controlled clinical trials to make sure that the benefit we see is a true benefit. Now in this page, in this uh, uh, um, study, you could see that even though both groups improved, the zilucoplan group improved far more than the placebo. The, the, the other trials in the complement inhibition similar, show the similar kind of results. They also show a significant, very uh, quick improvement in the early phase. And then this uh, improvement is maintained in this particular study with ravilizumab up until 26 weeks before the randomization ended. So this is all good news. So what happened to those people who are in the placebo arm, in the open label? So at the end of the randomization, they all get the drug. And you could see that in this graph uh, for those who receive zilucoplan, that you can see that the placebo arm, when they receive the uh, treatment and the open label extension, they also improve and keep up with the, with the, uh, the zilucoplan treated arm and continue to improve. So in summary, um, the complement inhibition has been shown to be effective um, in generalized myasthenia gravis who are ACHR antibody positive. And this improvement is seen as early as one week and is maintained. And it's important that uh, we also need to know about the safety profile. There were no major safety uh, uh, concerns raised. Uh, one of the uh, specific concerns we have is that C5 component of the complement is very important for us to protect ourselves against a bug called the Neisseria meningitidis related meningitis. So all those patients who receive the C5 inhibitors also receive immunization against meningitis and then the clinical trials did not show any, any patients with meningitis which is a, a great achievement. Now I move to the second class of drugs. Uh, this is a handful to say it's a neonatal FC receptor um, is, 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 uh, is the main actor in this uh, uh, scenario. Why this receptor is important is that uh, in the humans, this receptor is important to transfer mother's immunoglobulins, mother's protective immunoglobulins uh, through the placenta to the fetus so that the fetus has uh, and the newborn has some immunity uh, when they are born. So how does that happen? How it happens is um, the immunoglobulins that you can hear the red and, and uh, uh, blue Y-shaped structures are the immunoglobulins. They come into uh, the cells and they this yellow bit is like a seat. That's the FCR uh, and receptor. Um, and, and these immunoglobulins sit in this uh, seat. And when they're sat in the seat, they're protected from destruction. And they 
then circulate back into the uh, um, blood um, circulation. So thereby extending their life. So this extension of the life of immunoglobulins happens for both the healthy ones as well as the, uh, the, the culprits like ACHR antibodies. So what does um, FCRN blockage does? What it does is that it blocks this, the blue dot here that you can see is the FCRN receptor blockers. This is exactly what happened to me today, uh, but my seat in the aircraft was blocked so that I was ejected out of the aircraft and I had to take a later flight. So similarly, the immunoglobulins can't bind to this uh, because the FCRN blockers like f mod or the rosanolixizumab blocks this receptor so that the immunoglobulins who are loose gets destroyed thereby immunoglobulin levels are dropped in the serum, similar to plasma exchange. So the two drugs that I want to talk to you about is the f gartigimod and Rosanolixizumab. So if you look at these two drugs, they also, they're called ADAPT and MyCarin study. They used uh, antibody positive, ACHR positive uh, um, uh, patients at f gartigimod trial. They also use uh, anti must positive anti uh, myasthenic patients. The f mod was given as an intravenous infusion, whereas rosanolixizumab was given as an infusion under the skin. And these were treated every, once every week um, for four weeks in the f mod and six weeks in the other. If you look at the main outcome as assessed by the MGADL, and this was met in both the studies. So both the studies were successful. We know that f mod is now available through early access to medicine scheme in, in England. And this is uh, uh, the trial design for f mod They gave four infusions and then monitored the patient for four weeks to see how their uh, MGADL score responds. And this is a, a little a, a snapshot of their primary outcome, the main outcome. They look at the MGADL response and they found that two thirds of the patients who received the drug significantly improved on the MGADL. And, and there was also one third of placebo patients who improved as well. If you, if you look at what happens to their immunoglobulins, because we are, ex, we are expecting immunoglobulins to be reduced. Now, these patients who received the dark blue line are those who received the drug. And the light blue line up on the top are those who received the placebo. So the placebo received patients, immunoglobulin levels didn't change very much. But the patients who received the drug, these levels are significant dropped and once the injection stopped, they gradually came back up to a, a pre-treatment level. Now, what happened to their myasthenia? So my, uh, those who received the drug, these are this dark orange line, their myasthenia symptoms also improved. And then after the drug was stopped, the, it gradually symptoms started coming back. But interestingly, the placebo treated patients, even, uh, also, even though their immunoglobulins didn't drop, they showed some improvement, but as not as much as the patients who received the drug. In the, the other drug, the rosanolixizumab, they had placebo, and the two doses, uh, mild, small dose and a higher dose of the drug. And in summary, you could see that, that both the doses showed improvement in terms of the myasthenia symptom control. And, um, but when you look at the safety, those who received the higher dose did show some uh, um, uh, adverse events due to the drug compared to the lower dose. You can see the lower dose and the placebo, there weren't much of a difference. So in summary, uh, also the FCRM blocking drugs also show that they are effective in controlling myasthenia gravis symptoms. However, this is cyclical as you need to continue the drug um, in a cyclical manner. And there were no major safety concerns. Uh, however, the high dose of rosanolixizumab was associated with side effects. So in conclusion, uh, it is encouraging to note that there are new treatments coming up in myasthenia gravis. There are complement blockers as well as FCRM blockage. And there weren't, many uh, uh, there weren't any major safety concerns, which is exciting. And the efficacy was shown as I uh, explained. And um, what I also need to highlight is that a successful clinical trial is one thing, but regulatory bodies approving the drug is another thing. Because for the regulatory bodies, they not only look at the efficacy and safety, but also they need to establish the cost effectiveness uh, of the drug uh, before they approve. So, so far we have f mod, which is available on EAMS, uh, Early Access to Medicine Scheme, and the other drugs I'm sure will take uh, uh, the, the, the steps to ac uh, approach the regulatory bodies to obtain um, authorization in the UK. But this is a space that we need to watch and um, 
In the meantime, it is also very important that uh, patients with myasthenia gravis also through their clinicians engage in clinical trials so that uh, um, we, uh, one is that you can access these treatments of, uh, earlier on, and secondly, that you contribute to the growing body of uh, knowledge um, and, and, and how effective these treatments are in myasthenia. And thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be contacted if I get cut off. Um, Hello. Hi, I think um, Kate's lost her Wi-Fi, but I don't know if you want to take over, Jackie. <laughs> that, oh, yeah, I think we've, we've lost Kate. Um, if, if you just hold on with us a couple of minutes, I'll just um, see if, I, if Kate's rejoining. Thanks, Chana. No problems. I think if the uh, audience has any questions, I'm sure Isabel and I will be very happy to uh, answer. Of course. So Kate's just, Kate's just trying to rejoin. Um, I'll just give her a couple of minutes. I'll just have a look in the Q&A and um, see if we've got any questions. Apologies, everyone, we have had some technical difficulties this morning. There's a question on the Q&A. Is it okay, Jackie, if I read that out? Um, so uh, uh, one of our... Um, colleagues mentioned that uh, that they were diagnosed at the age of 19 uh, with myasthenia gravis and for the last 16 years um, uh, they have been in remission taking no medication at all the question is could you tell me if i could possibly get a flare-up um, and um, i think it's a she that she says she's 68 years of age um, and she also has a daughter who's 45 and has SMA type 3. Um, so myasthenia gravis, as you know, Isabel, is it okay if I um, um, yeah, go ahead. Make, make a start and then you can uh, chip in? Um, myasthenia yeah. gravis, as you know, is, is, is a, a relapsing remitting condition. It's, it fluctuates. Um, and... Uh, it, and, and it is great news that um, you, your condition has gone into remission and, uh, and you aren't requiring no medication at all. And um, I wondered whether you have uh, had any thymectomy in the past, um, because uh, patients who have had thymectomy are also at, uh, are likely to um, undergo remission with time to come um, than those who haven't had uh, thymectomy. Um, so it, uh, in the balance of probabilities, it is likely that you uh, could remain uh, 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 free of flare-ups, but it is very difficult to predict who might uh, and might not have a flare-up. Um, Isabel, um, is, is that a fair comment? Very good. I, I fully agree. I wouldn't say anything different. I agree that because this is that at the age of 16 uh, is very likely patient had a thymectomy, but of course we don't know the type of condition that's more likely to be. And I agree with you. We hope and there is a high chance of not having flare-ups in future, but we cannot say for certain. Thank, thanks so much. Thank Thanks so much, Maria. So I'm, I'm going to um, just try and pick up from where Kate left off. So apologies if I duplicate anything. Um, so thanks so much, both um, Maria and Chana. Um, I don't think that there's any other questions. I'm just having a really... Like, there is just another now. one. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, there are, oh, there's a few. There is you. you just moved down and there was one yeah. there. I can see that. I, I can read that out. I, I can read out the next two questions, and then I think what we'll do, if it's okay with everyone, is we'll move on to the living well section. Because I'm, I'm aware that we're we're just maybe a wee bit behind yes. time. So we've had a comment um, in the chat there that says, um, "I was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis, age 17, in 1995. It was not until many years later that it was accurately diagnosed as musk positive. 
Do patients with musk positive myasthenia require an entirely different approach and or treatment? And is there anything one is there anything one should be doing differently, particularly with regard to the ongoing COVID-19 management? Is Chana or um, Maria? I if, if I may. Um, okay, sure. so I understand this patient is probably now older than, yeah, and okay, was well, 17 in 95, okay, it's, it's older now, and um, it's not clear there if the patient is still symptomatic or not. The approach uh, for the old treatments that are still current treatments is not completely different. When we start treating, it's similar. Now, more and more, we have... Um, the option of treating with rituximab earlier on rather than the AC Sharad blood disease. And the new treatments, there is the anti complement medication, doesn't work for mask because a complement is not activated there. Uh, that, these are the main differences. So we see more and more, um, we target more and more the treatments for the type of disease. It's true, not completely different, but we now have a different approach. Yes. Uh, Shanna, do you want to add? Yes, I, I, I uh, totally agree. There's uh, nothing new for me to add. Um, there was one uh, little statement there saying that particularly with regards to ongoing COVID-19 management, whether there would be anything done differently. Um, the only thing that I could think of differently is that if you're on, on ongoing immunosuppressive therapy, if there was the risk of COVID-19 infection or uh, uh, you might be able to access the antiviral uh, treatments uh, through NHS. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much to you both. Um, and I'll just ask this last question um, and then we'll move on to live and well section if that's okay. Um, and, and what I would say is any, if anyone um, has any questions that we don't have time to answer today, if you want to contact us directly, and I'm sure we can share that with the panel and they would be ha happy to answer after the seminar as well. Um, I'm just a wait of time. Um, so I'll just ask this last question. So I, I've, someone's commented to say um, they've just started FMGARD due to start second cycle on 29th of March. My symptoms only improved slightly. Can I expect a bigger improvement on the second cycle? Also, how soon can steroids be reduced? I'm on 60 milligrams a day plus inject methotrexate as a as drug resistant and several crisis. Is anyone just able to answer? This is trickier uh, to uh, answer. Uh, I would say, <laughs> I, 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 I'll pass you Shana in a second. Sure. Not knowing all the details of the patient is more tricky, is trickier. It's more difficult, I would say, not all patients respond well to every single treatment, even if you reduce the antibodies. Like plasma exchange, not every patient responds well to plasma exchange. Others respond better to IVIG, others to steroids, other microfilate, etc. So not knowing detail is more difficult. But I would say that I'm sure the doctors who prescribe the FKT mod will give the second uh, infusion and then see the second cycle, let's say and see where they go. But certainly not every single patient responds the same way. Yeah, and and that, that's a very important point uh, uh, that Isabel raises. I know that we don't have time to go through all the details of the health. Um, so normally advice is very specific and tailored made to the patient. But in general, if I make a, may, were to make a comment, um, the FKTGMOD trial, uh, the data that we I showed you is after one cycle, only two thirds of the people improved, but uh, there is a proportion of patients who improved after the second and the third cycle. The good news here is that uh, this patient has shown some improvement because uh, uh, um, I do not know whether that was objectively measured with MGADL or other scales. Seeing some improvement is good and with, I'm hoping that that's, that has been captured objectively and yes, changing steroid doses, etc. you need to discuss with your clinician. I, I don't think this is the right time to do it. Okay. Thank, thanks so much to you both. Um, so if it's okay with everyone, we'll just move on to the living well um, part of today's seminar. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to introduce, um, we're, we're being joined by um, Mary Quirk, um, Sarah Bailey from MyAware, 
um, Amanda Hayes and myself um, will be joining um, Chana, Maria and um, Charlotte. So I know everybody really um, submitted their biographies in advance of the seminar, but just because of time, I'm wondering if, if everyone's happy to kind of introduce themselves and explain a bit about their role and their experience of supporting people. Um, and I'm really happy like that Kate <laughs> just joined us. <laughs> I'm so sorry, <laughs> but go for it. Go how you were doing. Um, I'm so sorry. Open reach seemed to have camped now outside in my road, so I've I've got a big problem. But I'll, no problem. I'll hand it over to you and Jackie. <laughs> I'm glad you're back, Kate. Really glad you're back. Um, so if you don't, if it, if it's okay, um, Mary, can we come to you and you can just introduce yourself um, and explain a wee bit about your role and and what it is you do to support people living with myasthenia. Oops, just on mute there. Hello, I'm Mary Quirk. I'm a neuromuscular specialist nurse. I work at the John Ratcliffe alongside um, Dr. Late. My role is to um, work in clinic um, and supporting patients in clinic. And I also work remotely as in I'm a source of contact for patients outside of clinic times. And essentially I'm there, I have a nursing role I have is a clinical role and it's a care role so I'm a prescriber so I can um, manage treatment support patients suggest treatments always in conjunction with Dr Late and then I, I look at care and how I can enable people to live well um, and manage their lifestyle and essentially put my senior very much in the background yeah. fantastic thank you mary and it's great great to see you um so um next to, to to mary um i think we're going to turn to um to sarah now if you'd like to introduce yourself hi everyone and thanks for letting us join you today letting me join um i'm one of the support coordinators with my aware um we're part of a wider team there's three of us that, that work part-time across the week and we support people over the phone, email, Zoom, social media, that sort of thing. And our wider team involves uh, a benefits and welfare officer and a counsellor, and we're managed by a national support manager. Um, and I got involved with the charity around nine, nine and a half years ago when my partner was diagnosed with my senior. And it's been an interesting journey for us. He was a paramedic and had never heard of the condition. So coming from that angle, living alongside it and finding out about it along the way. So yes, I got involved um, and I'm fortunate to be able to do this role and to bring to bring what I know to it. Um, our team does all sorts of things from running Zooms, so welcome Zooms for new, for new members, um, drop-in Zooms for people that just want to pop in and listen or ask questions. We oversee social media, we, we post regularly, we respond to people. And we just try and help wherever we can um, just to support people, not only living with the condition, but living alongside it. We like to offer, you know, a listening ear and a chat, help reduce any isolation that people are feeling to reassure, connect and signpost. So that's sort of our role in a nutshell. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. And Amanda, over to you. Hi everyone, thank you for letting me join you today. Apologies if I sound a little bit gruff, but I have got COVID, uh, which brings me back to China. I've just had a three-day antiviral infusion up at um, Guy's, Remdesivir, so fingers crossed I will feel very well soon. Had MG now for 31 years, was diagnosed when I was 26. Um, um, I've been working with NICE to, uh, as an appraisal um, board, doing another one this year. Um, I've worked actually with the Myasthenia Gravis Association prior to my aware many years ago as one of the secretaries and then treasurers before it, it, it amalgamated into something else. Um, happy to join back again if anyone ever needs me. Um, I'm com currently working with the MD UK um, to hopefully set up or we are in the process of setting up the um, Muscle Matters Group for M um, MG. Um, I'm also a volunteer at King's College Hospital and um, really do anything. I've set up a WhatsApp group at King's. We're called the Big Dippers. Um, I think everyone would understand why. And um, I try to um, help wherever I can to show that you can live. I don't let MG define me. 
is something that just comes with me. It's like a little handbag. Um, and I just move on and um, help where I can. And that's about it, really. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, Amanda. And thank you for joining us when you have COVID as well. Uh, I'm, I'm getting through and beyond. Um, <laughs> no, no, and no, no, anything to help. And I do love the idea of uh, of MG being a handbag, but it's uh, a handbag. <laughs> Mulberry, maybe. Sure. I mean, well, it will. Your it is a very r- rarefied one, I'm sure. And <laughs> finally, just to hand over to Jackie. Thank you for stepping into the breach, then. Um, and Jackie, over to you. No problem. So, um, morning, everyone. I'll introduce myself properly now. So, um, so my name's Jackie, and I've been working at MD UK for just coming up five years now. Um, so my role as, as Regional Information and Advocacy Manager in Scotland um, and I'm part of a team that provides information, support and advocacy to individuals and families living with muscle wasting conditions or related neuromuscular conditions across the UK. Um, so the majority of my time is spent providing support to people living in Scotland but I do also provide support across the UK as and when it's needed. Um, so my role is very broad. Our team takes a kind of really holistic, comprehensive approach to the support that we provide. Um, so by that, I mean that we provide support in a range of areas. Um, so for example, we're there for people at the point of diagnosis, providing emotional support and helping to navigate through some of the systems and practicalities. Um, so that could be accessing the right benefits and equipment. Um, but we also provide support to people at different stages of their life. So that could be during periods of change and variability. Um, if people are experiencing periods of rapid deterioration, um, we provide emotional and practical support around that. Um, or it could be having to move home or supporting with benefits reviews. If we aren't able to provide support, we work collaborative, collaboratively with other organisations or we signpost on if that's more appropriate. Um, but overall, you know, we, we provide support in a, in a huge range of areas. Um, we provide support both virtually through our helpline info inbox and online um, via Teams or Zoom, um, or if, if possible, we provide support in person as well. Um, information about how to contact us was provided at the beginning of the seminar today, um, and I think we'll share that at the end again as well. Um, specifically in relation to myasthenia gravis, um, many of the queries that we receive are relating to um, fatigue management and kind of how the condition varies on a day-to-day basis and how that impacts on people's lives. That's all from me, Kate. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so thank you to um, people who have submitted questions in advance. Um, I've got a few in front of me and please do put them into the Q&A um, section if you have any questions for those of you still on the call. Um, so let's start out with um something that is probably i should imagine something that many people who have my senior growers um are, are kind of concerned about and this person says i'm worried about how my condition fluctuates from day to day is it normal to experience this with my senior gravis or could there be something else that's causing this um i mean i don't know where we want to start i mean maybe um perhaps um sarah you might um mary rather you might be able to to, to speak to this best of all I'm unmuted, aren't I? Yes, you are. I can hear you. I'm just going to hang up. In terms of that question, it's quite hard to answer that because it, it comes with a lot of factors that, are, you know, my senior, an individual, we like to look at them holistically. And there can be a lot of other factors that can affect an individual why their my senior should fluctuate over the course of the day so without a fuller background it is quite difficult to answer that question but however I would say it's important you know to be looked at holistically um and consider the whole picture that you know is is the the, the my senior it's the lifestyle it, those things need to go together to manage that individual more effectively but we do know that my senior waxes and wanes and the the key things that impact on it are infections and stress and lifestyle so those are important things to consider and always ensure that you're on the the better side of them and that sometimes my senior 
is you know sometimes that you need to re is someone would describe it not as a wake up call but just something you know you reevaluate how lifestyle works and how you know the value of pacing and prioritizing that's what i'd like to add to that that question the thank, answer. thank you thank you mary and i mean amanda from your perspective I, mean, I appreciate that yes everyone is different and everyone will have their own specific things but i guess Absolutely. from your perspective um amanda is that sort of something you you feel on i mean maybe yeah. not right now but <laughs> no i'm fine i'm fine i promise i th i think um the fluctuations are always going to be there there is no way you can guarantee one day you're going to be fine the next day you're going to be fine you know i think sometimes uh, from a well-being point of view you've got to just accept that day-to-day -day fluctuation and 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 be prepared to work around that people that care understand that you find you have to cancel so many things at the last minute and it's about adapting that you know people if you're going out for i found over the years that you 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 cancel so many dates with people and i think what what needs to happen is it's your family and friends become your support network obviously however you adapt the situation you're going into um going out for dinner for instance you know you you make these plans and then at the last minute you've got cancelled because you're your, your MG's fluctuated. So then over time, you work out that, okay, we can't go to dinner. Every time we're going to meet up, we get a takeaway because then no one's put out. Mm -hmm. uh, silly things like that. You've just got to adapt the way you think because of the fluctuations. I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm actually saying what I'm, what I'm trying to get across is things have to be adapted to take fluctuations into account day, because daily you never know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You might, it's very difficult fluctuating yeah. Yeah, disease. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You've just got to be aware of this. You need the support around you because, and again, morning you might think, right, okay, this afternoon, let's make a meeting and have coffee with somebody. Then actually after lunch, you can't manage that. That person then understands that and comes to you or they they don't i mean i think <laughs> you can't dwell on them fluctuations day to day you've just got to adapt them into your life. does does that make sense yeah yeah way? so you kind of you're kind of suggesting you kind of roll with it and, just and the people around it. you the people that are close to you they'll get it. they will yeah. get it you yeah. know it's very yeah. difficult if you're working mm -hmm. work employees have got to adapt to that yeah yeah especially now people can work at home yes yes you, yeah it might be that you've got to work in the evening yeah you have a rest mid-afternoon and then go on yeah it, it, it i don't think that's an easy answer to this one to be fair no no i can it imagine. really isn't fluctuations yeah, yeah it, you've yeah. just got to roll with it actually Kate. Yeah. exactly yeah. that mm, and, and sarah is, is that is that your experience or your partner's experience as well absolutely and i echo much of, of what amanda said and mary as well but you learn that instead of being Sorry. able to just throw yourself at life that you have to break it down a little bit more and you have to sort of stagger things and and take smaller bites of the cherry so you don't set yourself 15 things to do that day you maybe do three that day and three tomorrow and you you, you like amanda says so important to have that support around you and that understanding as well I agree. Weather too. I, much of what Mary said, uh, you know, is is absolutely true. But weather, we learned in this house quite early on that it, that has a huge effect. That's and and it's always well documented that the heat is is the challenge, but also so is the cold. And we we just had this play out on social media yesterday in one of our closed Facebook groups. And it's is you know it's sort of underestimated the effect and the toll that it takes. Yeah, and I imagine at the moment as well with the with the price of electricity and heating and everything that must be a massive concern for people and and things that you you perhaps and and i imagine jackie are both getting um quite a lot of concerned calls about from people from families who are sort of you know how do you how do you make that balance yeah yeah we we've signposted people yesterday to the red cross because there was quite a lot of information on there and, and hints and tips but we opened it up onto our peer group yesterday you know has anybody got any ideas for you know, yeah. any economical ways to stay warm and to just yeah. just help to you know just to yeah. reduce that stress on the body absolutely yeah yeah jackie okay. is that same sort of thing that you've you've found as well 
Yeah, absolutely. I think what we are generally advising people to do as well is um, to look for local support available. I think quite a lot of the information is very specific to local areas um, as well. So it's worth looking into what support's available locally um, in terms of kind of cost of living and heating and things as well. That's really helpful. Thank you. So I'm going to move on to another question now, which um, is coming from someone who says that they suffer from um, really bad uh, urinary I can't say that word, urinary tract infections, UTI infections, um, about five times a year. And they're concerned at the level of antib antibiotics that they need to take to clear the infection. Um, and they seem to be getting severe headaches and becoming feverish. They've been through the menopause. Um, could it could things be made worse um, by their um, myasthenia gravis meds? Could could that be a, 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 a factor? I imagine it's pretty difficult to necessarily say but for without any more information, um, uh, Mary, but I, I wonder whether there's anything that you, you could you could say to this person and maybe Maria, um, Maria Isabel, I'll come to you afterwards. Thank you, um, Kate. Yes, it is. It's as again, it, you, it's looking at the whole picture. But one of the, the if you are on immunosuppressants, it's quite hard to say because the immune system is so individual. Some people can be on a very you think, a heavy weight of immunosuppressants and they just sail through things. They never get infections or if they get an infection, it's very mild. They just sail through it. Where the other individuals, they can be on you know, lesser levels of immunosuppressant, but they're very prone to infections. But we do know there is a relationship between immunosuppression and infections. But as again, again, the immune system is so individual, related to your age, your past exposure, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it's important to, you know, the she's the ladies, the individual's very right about the impact of continue, you know, is concerning to be on antibiotics so often and the impact that can have. But again, it's going holistically. And you're know, looking further than just set, you know what is going on, and she may need some further, um, you know, talk to her GP. Would it be appropriate to see um, a urologist? This looks perhaps needs further investigation. Mm -hmm. It's always important to look holistically and not just say that is the cause. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And Maria Isabel, do you have anything to add to that? I agree. I don't know if uh, if you know the age and the sex of patient is a female. They're female postmenopausal. So yes, I presume. Yes. Okay. So it's more prone to urinary infections anyway. Mm -hmm. And we agree that um, that myasthenia or any autoimmune condition gets worse when patients have infections. And we have had patients that come much worse. We give treatments, plasma exchange, IVIG, this, that, and they only improve after we treat the infection if it was not identified early on. So that is one of the things. But now is, yeah, I agree, looking at why the patient has so many infections and see if that can be reduced or prevented would be great. Um, mm -hmm. It's not always related to immunosuppression. Yeah, super. Thank you. Yes, I mean, yeah, I can see that. So actually, I didn't, I didn't really do a really good job of, of organising the questions that came in advance in a, in a logical order. I'm very sorry. So we're going to sort of go back a step, if you like, and talk similarly around the same sort of thing that we were discussing before, which was um, sort of relating to what you were saying, um, Amanda, but probably taking on a step further about how do I cope on days when my symptoms are particularly severe? Is there something I could do to help prepare for these days to manage work and family responsibilities? So it's sort of, I suppose, yeah, on, on the on the bad days, how, how do you deal with that? And how, can you can you sort of plan ahead to some extent for those? Well, I think if you, if you wake up on a bad day, then you've just got to realise it's a bad day. Pace yourself. So all I can say is make sure you take baby steps, really. Make sure you sit if you've got something to do. Don't talk. You know, it's a big thing. People like you slur, you can't chew. Again, on a bad day. So pace yourself. Get up a little bit later. Work out what your priorities are for that day. 
If that's one thing out of 10, do that one thing. And, and that's it really. Pace mm-hmm. yourself, prioritize, and then forget about other things. It, sadly, that is the only way you can do it. Forgive I me for asking so. what might be a, um, a well, it is coming from a point of ignorance. If you've had a fairly busy day the previous day, mm-hmm. can you expect that the next day might be more challenging for you, or or is that is it still sort of too fluctuating? We talked about the fluctuations before. No, I think I think if you've had a busy day, whether that's stressful, physical, mental, I think you can you can expect some form of um, fluctuating weakness yeah. um, the second day, the third day, even, you know, it could go, it depends on how busy that day is, but it could take two to three days to get over. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think you've just got to realise that any plans you make on one day, if they're, if they're quite substantial, try and rest the second day. Doesn't mean it always works that way, but yeah. on the whole, I think so. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. And be aware that, it could be dramatic. It's not just a little bit of fluctuation. If you've had a really heavy day, it could be a dramatic um, weakness the second day, but it's not because your MG has actually got worse. It's because you've had a busy day. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, you've not exacerbated the, the disease itself. The, if, if you see what I'm saying, it's yeah. just had a busy day. Yeah, you've sort of worn yourself out and then yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, then you'll, yeah. yeah, I absolutely. see, I see. You know? yeah. and, and make sure if you've got a busy morning even, the afternoon is free. Yeah. It, it's not just about the next day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if I may make a comment, this is exactly that. And some patients say, yes, I know if I have a good day, I try to do everything and day after I suffer that. The, you learn what to do and how to do and if you really need if you are well you really need to do something you do but you know that then you spend the other days mm. but i was going to say something when you mentioned that is not as an exacerbation of myasthenia you know that if you rest then is your myasthenia as it is what i was going to say is can patients not to get better of that. What I mean is, I know that many patients are as they are and is the best they can be. And that fluctuates and they have those limitations, bad, bad days, good days, etc. At the same time, you wonder whether could this be better? Although this is not the true exacerbation of disease, you don't need to go to doctor, you don't need to change medication. Does this represent disease is not under control? That's what I mean. And so, of course, if this is a very long-standing disease, you may not have much to change in your treatments. But if it is early on, I would suggest patients be a bit more ambitious and ask, can something be done about this? Because you have very young and potentially active people not coping with normal activities, not having the disease very well controlled. And still, we hear many times, oh, this is the best you'll be. And not always accepting this is fine for a while until you are certain this is the best you can get. Mm, That's interesting. Thank you. Um, Jackie, you put your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted um, to kind of touch on what Amanda had um, mentioned as well about um, planning and pacing. There's quite a lot of literature around the three P's in relation to kind of preserving energy and fatigue management. So planning, pacing and prioritising. So I just wanted to draw people's attention to that um, as well. And and things around um, kind of support networks, you know, can people draw on their support networks to plan ahead for days that might be more difficult when conditions are more severe and I think Amanda had uh, mentioned earlier on about um, working flexibly as well just to kind of manage those days where symptoms might be more severe. Um, I just wanted to bring attention as well to um, two of our resources in relation to fatigue management. Um, So we have our fatigue management um, muscles matters seminar um, that's available on our YouTube channel but we also have our fatigue management guidelines that were published quite recently as well. So if anybody wanted any links to them, um, if they get in touch with us directly, we can email them out as well. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you very much. 
and and Sarah I guess from from your family sort of perspective as well about sort of those managing the bad days if you like or or, or you know do you have any other top tips or have been pretty thorough thus far I think I think pretty much it's been covered um really well and I think it's a very accurate picture sometimes I, I would say too and Amanda, you might agree that sometimes there is no rhyme or reason. And I think they're the more challenging days when you haven't been that busy. And, and I also think that it's quite a fine line that, that you walk at times, isn't it? Because, you know, you, I can say to my partner, sit down, put your feet up. I don't want to sit down, put my feet up. OK, so why don't you do this? Well, I don't feel like doing that. Like, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you can't you learn, don't you? You have to you absolutely have to learn. Otherwise, there's, there's no other way. I would say on the days when things are more challenging to, to make things easy for yourself. Maybe don't have, uh, I don't know, something ambitious for dinner. Have to something that's easier to digest and to chew and that sort of thing. And just maybe if you can keep the house a bit warmer, you know, and just pull back on things instead of going for a, a long dog walk, which is what we love to do, you know, go for a shorter dog walk and, and have a coffee stop halfway halfway through. Just little things that, that all sort of individually don't seem to make a lot of difference, but collectively they can. So bite-sized things, sitting down to shave, maybe, you know, sit on the side of the bath to have a shave instead of standing up. Little things that, that put together can make the difference and make it a better day for, for not only for my partner, but for, for people around him as well. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can I just um, step in here about going back to, to food? Um, mm -hmm. I, I've got quite, um, I've got dysphagia. So my swallow, if anything, is my weakest point. And I spoke to um, my um, speech and language therapist at King's. I'm saying, oh, you know, at my evening meal, I'm quite tired. I choke, blah, blah, blah. And she said, well, just don't talk <laughs> when you're eating. You know, I mean, I find that quite difficult, but you know, try not to talk too much. Rest prior to your meal. Eat your meal, but, you know, make sure that you don't talk too much. Revelation to me. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it's true. That these things can weaken and the other thing is and there is some research into it and I think I've spoken about this before to you know, sparkling um, fluids I, I couldn't work out why I always ate my meal a lot easier with a sparkling water and um, there is some research into dysphagia and sparkling fluids now it helps me it might not help anybody else but there is some research out there which was enlightening to me. So it it might work for others just to just to make a note of that. Speak to a clinician first. I'm I'm not a clinician. S speak to speak to those. See whether it works for you. It works for me. I know other people that it works for. But it, it was an eye opener for me. Just yeah. research it. Yeah. That's so interesting. And it's only coming along to things like this and, and engaging with other people yeah. that either work with the condition or live with it, that you learn these things. We're, mm. we're building a hints and tips document, which is getting bigger by the week. And it's that sort of thing, Amanda, that we'd pop straight on there because it can help. I remember someone, one of my members, when I, when I used to be out on the road, talking about taking medications with tepid water instead of cold because it was less constriction on the throat. All those sorts of things is just, mm -hmm. just I think, really helpful to know, just to help ease the path a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. It does definitely work for me. And there is research out there. Not a lot, but there is research out there. Mm. Well, that's fantastic. And actually, that's interesting. I was, I was going to ask about the the value that um, the, the support networks and, the, and your peer to peer conversations have. And <laughs> you've answered the question before I even got to ask it really between you. But I know, I mean, obviously, Amanda, you've been instrumental in setting up your um, I've forgotten the name already. The, the Dippers, Big Dippers. The King, yeah, the yeah, Dippers. yeah, it's um, quite, yeah, it's, there's not big. There's only a few of us, mainly yeah. because we met when we was having plasma exchange. Right. And um, yeah yeah we, we we support each other and the other thing it does is it, it eases the burden sometimes on the cns's because we will answer between us the problem that we've got therefore it cuts down on on the time we go back to the clinicians and say oh i've got this can you help me actually we can we can resolve the problem around talking on the group and I think sometimes the burden on the clinicians 
is, is quite difficult because of fluctuating symptoms, going back to the fluctuation. People become very frightened very quickly if they fluctuate and dip quite quickly. So therefore they go back to the clinician. Well, th this is the whole point of the peer groups. Mm -hmm. We support, I mean, it's in the wording, isn't it? We support each other, but our little group is quite um, exclusive really to the plasma department, the a sys department at King's because we've just got to know each other. And um, yeah, so far it's working really well. Mm. I think that's so, I think that's so invaluable, Amanda, to have that support and that yeah. check in when when people have gone home, when people have finished their working day, and you're checking in, you know, something of an evening or of a weekend. Um, we have three three support groups, closed Facebook support groups for for my my aware members. We've got a peer support group which is nudging towards seven hundred members at the minute, um, and one for our young generation group, eighteen to thirty nine. That stands at around 160, I think. And then we've got one that supports people with children, that people that either care or are parents for children. And that's around 90 members at the minute. And the exchanges that go on there all the time, and because we moderate these groups, we see conversations playing out. We can feed into them if we've got anything useful to help, to help add to them. Um, and we just keep an eye and just make sure that people aren't giving medical advice because we're, we're not mm. in a position to do that nor to to agree or to disagree um and that's when we're very lucky also to be able to draw on the support that we get from our medical committee and our specialist nurses too um so yes i think that support and that being able to check in with other people who are potentially walking a same the same or a similar path to you is just invaluable those questions that perhaps you wouldn't also necessarily want to ask or feel feel that you know that you've got a chance to ask they get yeah. answered Mm -hmm. I can imagine that there are certain things that somehow it just doesn't feel right to ask the clin clinician at your appointment, but you might, if you've got close to some people, or either they can help you find, navigate to an answer or they can help you find the way of framing a question in your session so that you don't feel either it's a silly question or, or it's just embarrassing or whatever it might be, you know, you just don't want to feel awkward. So I, I can see how having that network of people is is so so fantastic so um yeah no that, that that's really that's really fantastic she says again um moving on to, to some more questions so um these probably are probably more to to you uh, uh maria isabel about do patients with uh musk positive so that's the muscle specific kinase positive myasthenia require an entirely different medical approach and or treatment and is there anything that one should be doing differently um this one possibly is an older question because it's also particularly with regard to COVID management. So maybe we take the two things separately. First of all, yes. does that group of patients have a, a different treatment regime? And then do we the, 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 the COVID question? Yes, I think it was addressed earlier, but it's absolutely fine. Yes. So it's not a completely uh, approach, completely different approach. There are aspects that are different. And I think now what we know now, and if I diagnose a new patient with mask antibodies, I may take a different approach. Yes, correct. But to start with, I'll discuss with the patient what are the possible treatments. And I will, in regards to new treatments, I will say complement inhibitors or anti-complement, they are not for these patients. Yeah. All the other treatments yeah. are possible. And I will add, it's well known that rituximab or any other anti-CD20 medication are very good for these patients and improve them quickly. They also improve well with plasma exchange and any other, so other treatments, it depends. But if, I, for example, this is for new patients. If I have a patient that, like one that uh, was, Told, we were told, uh, I think it's this patient diagnosed very late, and this is from 90 something. We still change the treatments now, after all these years, if they are still symptomatic. We have patients that were needing um, no needs invasive ventilation during the day because the di di diaphragm is usually affected. And after many years of disease and many years of being needing this, we went back to rituximab. We, we started rituximab and they improved. 
That shows that that uh, fear of the neuron square junction being damaged irreversibly may not be happening in the musk myasthenia, which is very good news. So mm -hmm. yes, have a low threshold rituximab, but not every patient with musk myasthenia will probably need or probably be able to get it. It's important patients are aware of that and that uh, to be guided to the right place. In regards to COVID vaccine, I have a huge problem with that. I would make sure that patients are informed. And as with any other vaccine, if you are going to be on rituximab, try to do the vaccinations before. If like seasonal vaccines, if you receive rituximab every six months or every eight months or one year, and if they are seasonal vaccines, you need just to fit them around to the time when your immune system is recovering and then have the vaccines respond to them and then get your treatment. Brilliant, thank you. There's a question that popped up in the Q&A and this is just cruel because I can never really say it properly, but is if is Fgotigimod um, an, an immunosuppressant? I think it, it isn't, wouldn't be classed as that, but... Okay, it's not classed as such, but reduces significantly the immunoglobulin levels, although transiently, and although it doesn't class as immunosuppressive, if someone, if... If you receive that medication and if your immunoglobulins are going to be extremely at low level and for very long, you may be in risk of having infections. And Brilliant. some people say even you can you may need the immunoglobulins to recover that. So uh, it's not classed, but the immunosuppress somehow by reducing the immunoglobulin levels that you need. Right. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And then I'm, I'm mindful of time um, and I can't see any more questions in the Q&A. Um, I don't know whether that's because I've now joined with a different device and I just can't see them. Jackie, I'm looking to you just to well, see. I think we've answered all the questions in the Q&A. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, in that case, I think what I will do is go around um, the, the panellists in case they have any further questions. Um, comments or, or um, anything else they want to raise before we go get to the end. And I'm going to start going around my screen. So Mary, I, may I start with you? Is there anything else you'd like to, to add or to say? Obviously, I'd echo everything that's been said this morning, but I'd just like to emphasise it's always important to look holistically. It's not just the, it may not just be the my senior, always look holistically at the patient. And that's how Dr. Late approaches it in Oxford. We, you know, it's holistic. Um, and it also, you know, the pacing is important, but also the other echo is very important to be prepared to revisit things. You know, how can we improve this? Is it the right approach? What else can be done? And, mm -hmm. you know, to think, can there be more? And echoing those thoughts again, about the fluctuations, is this the right treatment? Can we do something better? That's, that's, I'd like to echo those. Brilliant, thank you very much. And Sarah, you're next on the hit list. <laughs> so go around my screen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I'd like to just, just remind people that it's quite handy to keep a diary of symptoms because then you can see if there are any, any fluctuations, you can see if there are any patterns and also that it's very helpful, I'm thinking to, to either let your consultant know beforehand anything or to take along with you it's a good prompt um and just to say that that here at my way we're here to support you whether you're affected directly or or indirectly um membership's free and i'm sure kate you can share our details with anybody and, and just to say thank you for, for having us along today it's been brilliant so yes thank you so much oh you're welcome you're welcome it's great thank you um amanda any any other thoughts from you not, all I would like to say is remember you're not alone. You know, there's so much support out there. MD UK, My Aware, the hospital, the clinicians. Always ask. Always yeah. ask. The stress will make the MG worse if you don't get support. That's it, really. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Maria Isabel. Um, I was just going to 
are that new things are appearing in terms of treatments, in terms of uh, trials. I wish no patient thinks that being a trial is being a guinea pig. If no trials means no development, no better treatments, no better care. And so if patients get information about new drugs, new treatments, ask their consultants, and if they don't know, ask MyAware, ask MBUK, or ask to be referred, that always an answer. And mm -hmm. even if we say we have, we don't have currently the trial for you uh, running. We may have in six months, we may have in three months, or you may not have criteria at all. You may not meet any of the criteria. Right, is, is an answer. Mm -hmm. At least get involved, be um, ambitious and, and not just sitting. It, it's, it's sad sometimes. It's good when patients know that there is not much more to do, that they accept and they live the best they can with the, what they have got. But until then, I think it's important that in a comprehensive way, rational way, uh, and calmly, they look for something better. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And Charlotte, we've worked together on um, some of the treatments that are coming through when we've been approaching NICE and obviously um, Amanda mentioned that, but I mean, obviously, is there anything you wouldn't wanted to add at all? Yeah, I mean, everyone's kind of covered everything uh, that we can think of, but yeah, well, on the um, topics of new treatments coming through, just probably a thank you to anybody who's here listening to this MLR that has, you know, volunteered to take part, whether that be providing feedback on surveys, if they have been, you know, uh, going through a treatment with FR Tigamod or anything along those lines that are coming out um, to be vigilant to how they're responding to medication, whether they obviously don't know whether they're in the placebo group or not, but to keep on top of those things. And, and yeah, thank you for taking part and thank you for inviting us to the seminar today because it's been very, it's been a great perspective to have the sort of research side of things, but then also uh, with the support um, Sarah, what she does, and, and everybody else, and, and Amanda, especially as well, and, uh, and Mary, your perspective. Can I, can I just mention the My Real World app? Because from oh, a yeah. research point of view, it is, is and has been quite phenomenal, and it is, it, it, it is working really well, I believe. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. Thank you for remembering that. <laughs> um, and Jackie, last word to you. Yeah, I, I won't take up much time. I just wanted to, um, just similar to what Sarah had said, if anyone um, would like to get in contact with us for if they have any questions or need any information um, sent across, then please do. The only other thing I wanted to mention was MD UK's peer support network um, as well. So if you did want to speak to someone um, living with the condition in the UK, then do get in contact with us and we can arrange that as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you. It's just clicked over to midday. So I, this is the perfect moment to thank all of the fantastic panellists. Thank you for being so candid with us. It's, it's been really great. So Chan, obviously, in his transit at the airport, thank you to him, but also to, to Maria, Isabel, to, to Mary, to Sarah, to Amanda and Charlotte and Jackie. Thank you all so much. Thank you all for watching. And um, there will be um, the video posted in due course on our on our channels. And yeah, thank you to MyAware for being with us today. It's been, been great. And also, finally, thank you to our sponsors, PTC Therapeutics and Lexion. So thank you, everyone. And goodbye. Thank you very much.